Amen. Take a Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Hurry up and do that. Man, I'm in a preaching mood tonight. Uh, I usually stay up kind of late, so it won't bother me tonight if, if I stay here kind of late and preach. It won't bother me. It won't hurt me. Amen? Yeah, you guys are amen because you're going to get up and leave. It ain't going to hurt me either. I'll see you at home. First Peter chapter 1. Let me tell you where I'm getting at, then we'll get there. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy. How much mercy does He have? He's got a bunch of it. Amen. His abundant mercy hath begotten us again. He hath begotten us. That means we, He, he conceived us and He's brought us to birth. He has begotten us. We are His children. Begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by what? Oh, come on. You guys, I told you, act like there's a hundred people here. <laughs> kept by what? The power of God. If you could keep yourself, you would keep yourself. Can't do it. God is the one who keeps us. Amen? Kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. See, God's work in you is not done yet. It will be in the last time. When Christ appears in the air, and we see Him there, and we see dead people coming up out of the grave, and that twinkling of an eye, will and... And we are instantly changed into our new body. Then we'll know God's done with us. Amen? But he that hath begun a good work in us will continue it, the Bible says. And I believe God's going to do that. Amen? So we're kept by the power of God. So and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how God keeps us. We've been talking about David and we've been talking about uh, Saul and Solomon and things like that. And uh, I want you to take your Bible and go to the book of Psalms, head in that direction while I find the slide that I want to find. Yeah, there we go. Psalm 23, Psalm 89, turn to the Psalms. And I want you to see this. Psalm 23, y'all know that one says, don't you? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, that used to, I used to not understand that when I was young. And I'm going, well, he's my shepherd. Why don't I want him? Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm going, no, I do want him. Then I went, I grew up and I understood what it meant. I have, I don't, there's not anything I need. There's not anything else I need when the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. You start, listen, God can take better care of you than you can take. You're a sheep. Sheep don't do well by themselves. Do they? They do not do well by themselves. Ryan said he was talking to somebody that keeps sheep today. He just texted you about that? Yeah. But sheep do not do well by themselves. They like being in a group. They like being part of the herd. And they, they do well when someone is the shepherd over them. So the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Um, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. My cup runneth over. Something like I'm, I'm losing it. But anyway, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And notice this. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now comfort, that word is always attached, number one, to the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter. Number two, the scriptures. The scriptures are the rod of God. Keep that in mind. They are the rod of God. Think about it. God's rod is what gives us comfort. And I'm going to show you that. And I'm, the rod that a shepherd uses is what keeps the sheep where they need to be. Remember, we do not keep ourselves. God is the one who keeps us. Amen? And think about what Jesus prayed in John 17. He, Jesus was praying to God and He said, All that you've given me, I've kept, except 
the son of perdition. And the only reason why Christ did not keep Judas, who was the son of perdition, was so that the scripture could be fulfilled. One of them had to betray him to fulfill the scripture so that Jesus would go and die on the cross for mankind's sins. All right. So in other words, it had to happen that way. If someone is like comes to church for a while, they come down to pray a prayer and they're in Sunday school for a while and they pay a few tithes for a while and they're in there for a while and all of a sudden something gets preached and they don't like it and they get mad and they split out of here. Listen, it's not that God was going, oh dear, I've lost them. I tried, but I just couldn't do it. That ain't God. God, listen, that fulfilled a purpose in God's kingdom. I may not understand it, but God had a reason for that. Okay? God doesn't lose anybody except it fulfills His purpose. All right? So, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The sheep are always comforted. God knows our psychology. He built it. He knows that we are looking for stability and security. Can I hear you say amen? What we want out of our government is stability in our government. Okay? Now, sometimes I don't like who's president. Sometimes I don't like who's Congress. Sometimes I don't like who's the sheriff, who's the judge, who's the mayor. I may not like it. But what I want is for America to be secure and stable and safe and not have to worry all the time about us losing our homes and our country and our, and our economy and our jobs. Amen. Okay? That's, that's where our comfort comes from. In the stability of knowing that things, that our constitution is going to be kept in place. That's our stability. And it's the law. So think of the constitution as the rod and the staff that keeps both government and the people in line where they need to be. And as long as that constitution's in place, we're going to be stable and we're going to feel all right. Can I hear you say amen? Now you think about that. The rod is what gives us the comfort of knowing that God is in charge of us and that even though God has to keep us in line, He's doing that for a reason so He can protect us and keep us where we need to be. Amen? Psalm 89, verse 32. This is... This goes along with what God had promised David concerning Solomon. And you know, God, he said, if he commits iniquity, verse 32, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. So, question number one. Does a born-again, Bible-believing, spirit-filled Christian ever commit transgressions and or sins? Yes. How many of them? As many as he can keep with a rod going across his back. Think about that. Because when God is chastening you and whooping on you and putting stripes on you, all of a sudden now you just don't feel like sinning the way you did earlier. How many of y'all know that? See, if you know that, that's evidence of God's Holy Spirit in your life. It's evidence that you are secure and safe and God has you and He's not going to let you get out of the fold. He's going to take a rod and He may gently bring you back and say, Now come on now, you need to stay away from that stuff. Or, if you persist, God will say, Come on now, we need to stay away from that stuff. Amen. Who in here had a parent that when they whipped you, they spoke to the beat of the whipping? I love that. Amen. But God said, I'll visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. How, and this is, how does God keep us? We are kept by the power of God. How does God keep us? Sometimes God keeps us with the rod. Okay? Isaiah eleven four. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. There's your, there's your clue right there. What is the rod of God? It is his word. 
So here's what will happen. I'll give, you an, I'll give you a biblical example. David committed his sin with Bathsheba. He committed adultery with her. She ended up pregnant. He brought her husband home to cover it up. That didn't work. He had her husband killed. The child is uh, born and dies. And David's thinking he's got away with it. Nathan the prophet is the Bible. The prophet, anytime the prophet shows up with the word of the Lord, that's your Bible. That's God's word. Nathan the prophet shows up, gives David this illustration of a, of a poor man, a king, who had all the things in the world and he was visited and he was going to put on a feast. So there was this poor man had one little lamb and the king, instead of going, getting one of his own, he steals the poor man's lamb and takes it and uses it for the feast. And... and Nathan says, what shall be done to the man? And boy, David just goes off and he said, I think the man ought to get what he's got coming. And Nathan said, David, thou art the man. And what happened was, Nathan the prophet chastised David with the word of God. When David was confronted with the word of God, with the preaching of the word of God, David instantly confessed his sins. And that's when David... David was a songwriter. He was a musician. Musicians always, they, um, they sort of emphasize or they relate what they're going through by writing songs. Okay? A lot, a lot of, a lot of musicians will do that. A lot of songs you hear from musicians are just things that they went through in life and they're writing out song, whether it's rock and roll, country, or whatever it is, or gospel. David sits down and he writes Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Uh, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. David is writing now how God has convicted him and chastened him, but God did it with his word. So think about it. When the devil succeeds in removing God's word, let's say out of a nation, I mean, everything to me goes back to the Bible. God, for some reason, just makes my whole life about the Bible. I can't help it. Because to me, everything boils down to God's Word. You remove God, In this scenario here, when you remove God's Word out of a nation, that means that nation has told God, we don't want your chastisement. God says, fine. You're a bastard nation. I give you no inheritance. You're not my children. Whenever a church, whenever a religious movement, whenever a person removes God's word out of their life, they're, they're telling God, keep your rod away from me. Don't touch me. I'm just wondering how many people have gone to a Bible-believing church, sat down, listened to the preacher, said, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. And then when that preacher went on something that they were guilty of, they bristled up, they got mad, they didn't like that, and they left that church. They went and found them a church that is not going to talk to them about their sin. What have they done? They have removed God's chastisement out of their life. They have said to God, you can't, I don't want you touching me on this issue right here. That is a bastard. That is, and I'm going to read that to you. That you're going to turn to uh, Hebrews 12. Okay? In fact, that, go ahead and make your way there. But he said, He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Okay? It all boils down to God's Word. God's Word is His rod. That's why we are comforted with the rod of God. Okay? So one day, I, I'll, I'll get up one day, Sunday, and I'll start preaching something, and I'll say, I have no idea who this is for. God told me to preach this, and I'm going to preach it. Somebody invariably, somebody in this church will say, Pastor, that was me. Or somebody will write me, send me a message. Say, Pastor, that was God told you to preach that for me. God was chastising me with that sermon. God was getting me with that. Okay? I have been chastened. Uh, Lisa and I one time... Uh, we was coming back from a meeting, us preaching. We put in some, we was traveling late at night and uh, wanted to keep awake. So we put in some Reg Kelly tapes, Jared. That'll keep me awake. And we got to one called um, When Dogs Bark. 
And it was rough. And the, the gist of that message was these old sins that we did years ago that we forgot about, God will bring back situations that's going to remind us of what we did and who we did it to and how rotten we are and we need to go back to that person and get that thing made right. Because when we hear the ducks, what happened was Nathan told uh, Ahab, or excuse me, Elijah told Ahab about the dogs going to, going to lick his blood up in the place where Naboth was killed. And Reg preached that he had dogs, a, a tape of dogs barking. And he started preaching on things, and I'm just going, my, and I had to shut the tape off. I had to listen to that sermon in pieces. Because it was, it was, it was, it was overwhelming to me. It was reminding me of things I'd done. Guilty. Still guilty. And, uh, I mean, it was getting me. He'd play that tape of dogs barking, and he said, here's Ahab walking down the street thinking everything's fine. All of a sudden, he hears dogs barking behind him. And all of a sudden, it comes to his mind about what Elijah told him, about how the dog's going to lick his blood. And he's thinking, is this it? Okay? And I'm telling you, the preaching of God's Word is meant to bring chastisement and correction to us. And God, you guys always pray for me that I don't use the rod on you first. Okay? Because if I'll preach something and use the rod on me first, I will have mercy on who I preach to. I'll hold back the rod because I know what it's like to get it. Does that make sense to everybody? That's what I want. That's how I want to be. I want to preach fair and square to everybody. That if I, if, if you're going to get it, I have to get it too. Okay? So my grandmother raised my, raised my mother and all of her brat children by herself in a single parent home. Just did it this way. If one kid got it, the whole bunch got it. Okay? If one kid was going to get a whipping, was, she was going to whip every one of them. Well, I didn't do that. Well, you did something else. I guarantee you that I didn't see. So you're going to, I might as well just get everybody. And my mom said that her oldest sister would always pinch the baby. Uncle John, make him cry, pick him up and hold him. Hold the baby while mama was giving out the whippings so that the oldest didn't get all the whippings. That's what she said, but I don't know if that's true. Okay, how does God keep us? Hebrews chapter 12. Are you there? Say amen. Have ye forgotten the ex exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. When God rebukes you, when God chastises you, when God corrects you, don't think that God is signaling to you that He's done with you. More than likely, the way I got it figured out, if God is done with you, you are relieved of the burden of ever feeling guilty ever again. God says in His Word that there are people whose conscience has been seared with a hot iron. They go out and from that point, they go out and commit all the sins they want to and never feel guilty about a one of them. That is a bad place to be. Now for them, they think everything's good. I do whatever I want to. I partake of whatever I want to. I don't, I don't have any regrets. I did it my way. And then they have to go stand before God. One way or the other, they're going to get it. It's better to get it here. Amen? But see, that's, that's when you are being rebuked, when you are under bad conviction, and I mean you're crying to God, be happy in that. Don't faint. When that's happening, don't think that God is, this is it. I'm going to throw you into hell any second now. You make the wrong move and I'll, I'll just finish with you. That is not, that's not what God's doing. God is rebuking you in a hot fashion because He loves you. And He knows you. 
He knows what you're guilty of. He knows what you're capable of. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow before you even think about doing it. God already knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And God's already got the belt or the rod in His hand ready to go. He's just waiting for you to catch up to the sin. Because He knows it's going to happen. And He's going to start chastening you. Now let me ask you a question. Does God use a rod against you every single time you sin? No, I don't believe He does. I believe sometimes the shepherd, all he has to do is lead the sheep. And they'll fall back in line. But every now and then, there's always, we, we kind of we're the, get to be the black sheep. And we kind of get out of line. And then God's gentle at first. He's kind. He's loving. Come on now, get back in line. And then when that don't work, then it's more forceful. And then, boom! Now get back in line. Okay? A good shepherd will do that with a sheep. He'll hit them. He'll strike them. And, that, and people say, that's cruel. No, it's not. That's how it works. And a good shepherd will know that. A good shepherd will know how to use that rod and when to use that rod. Now notice what I've been saying. Good shepherd. And he is. He's good at what he does. He knows when to apply the rod and when to use it just to bring us back in line. He knows exactly how much force to give us in life. How much force out of the Word to give us. He knows exactly how much to bring us back to where we need to be. Does He not? Sure He does. So now watch this. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth. Think about that word. When they scourged Jesus, did they leave marks? Yep. We're told by the historians, I guess, that they used what was called a cat of nine tails. This big leather whip with these little leather tentacles on it with pieces of metal and hooks and everything like that. And when they hit Jesus on the back, it just ripped open the flesh. And he was just bleeding. By the time they had applied those stripes to him, his back was just a bloody mess. And then they stuck a cross on top of that and said, carry that up that hill. Okay? Listen, you got it easy when you got it. Okay? You may not have ever gotten it that bad. But anyway, he said, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, if God does not chasten you, that ought to tell you something. It shouldn't tell you that you're so good, you don't get it. Because I'm here to tell you, you're not. You know how I know? Because I'm not. I'm not. I'm not so good that God never has to get me. Okay? Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? One of the worst things that has ever happened in America in the 20th and 21st century is these psychologists who have convinced generation after generation of parents that spanking children really doesn't do as well as positive reinforcement to that child. That has crippled and ruined America. Okay? I watch cop shows. I like them. I like it when the good guys catch the bad guys. My favorite show because of what I see in it is Campus PD. Policemen on college campuses. Because college students seem to me to be the worst of them all. Because every one of them, number one, thinks that they are legal experts. Number two, they, they think they know the law more than the cops do. Number two, they have, most of these kids have been raised to think 
that they can do no wrong and that everything they do, they have a right to do no matter how wicked it is. And no one has a right to catch them and tell them that they're doing wrong. And that's what I see out of them. These kids, these, they, they'll show up to these drunk parties and all of a sudden these drunk college students who are on government money, I don't think the government ought to just take over and pay for everybody's college. I think you ought to have to work for it. Does that make me popular? Okay, but anyway, they start smarting off to the cops and when the cops put them in custody, they say, what? Is there, are, are we the baddest thing going on in town? Like, don't you have better things to do? And it makes me, it makes me sick. Because you can see in that generation after generation of people that have been raised in this country that have never had correction applied to them one time in their life. And they think they can get away with anything. That's dangerous. I see a lot of church people that same way who, number one, have been told the danger that no matter what they do, God will never correct them and they'll still go to heaven. That's dangerous. That's wicked to teach people that. Somebody say amen. So he says in verse 8, But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, including preachers. And I'll tell you, preachers are the worst at it. Preachers are the worst at being corrected. Maybe it's the, the nature of the job. Maybe it's the pride that comes with being in an authority position. I don't know. Maybe it's all of that. But I can tell you that preachers are the world's worst at being corrected. And I know a lot of preachers. Okay? I know them. And I, especially the fundamentalist ones. We love to get together at our preacher's meetings and condemn everything in the world except ourselves. We're good at it. And I've been to meetings where, all, where a lot of that was going on and I don't go back. I don't. When I hear the men praising... And I hear the condemnation of everything in the world except what's inside that room. I just don't, I don't like that stuff, Pam. We went to some meetings down in Tampa years ago. And I told Lisa, I said, I'll never go back. Never. And haven't. Because that's all I heard was men praising and condemnation except... For the preachers that were at that meeting. And I want to tell you something. The preachers are the ones who need preached to. The reason why I like to go to some of these preachers meetings is to get preached at. And to get under conviction. And to get corrected. That's why I like to go. That's why I like to hear what other guys have to say. Because I need it. Okay? You guys always pray for me. God... Get my pastor if he gets out of line. God get him. God chase him. God, don't let him get away with stuff. Will you do that? You'll be in agreement with my wife. Amen. <laughs> okay? My wife does not want a bastard husband. She does not want a husband that cannot be corrected. I do not want children that cannot be corrected. I don't want grandchildren that cannot be corrected. And I don't want people in this church that will not receive correction. Okay? I don't want it. I don't want you here. Because you are bastards. And let me tell you, that word, you don't like that word? That word's in the Bible, and i got to say it. In this con, I'm not using it just because I'm getting away with saying a word that I would have got my mouth washed out. I'm telling you, it is a curse word for a reason. If you are a bastard, you are not a son of God and you are not going to heaven, period. And I read a church, and this, this was a fundamental King James church. And their doctrinal statement said 
because of their particular view of Scripture, they said that since they only follow Paul's teachings, that they do not believe that they are chastised by God. That was in their doctrinal statement. And I went, okay, I know who you are then. That was easy. You just admitted to me that you're a church full of and not sons. I believe in the sonship of the believer. I believe that we become the children of God. And as such, God will not have unruly children in His house. Now, having said that, let me say this. If somebody in the church is doing wrong, Whose job is it to correct that wrong? Say it. Thank you. Say it again. Say it. I want both sides. I want it. I want it equal. Whose job is it to correct somebody in the church? Thank you. It's not yours. Except. Maybe in the case where God's going to use you to restore such a one. The way the Bible says to. But if you go to somebody with the idea, I'm going to, I'm going to get them out of here for that. I hope God gets you on the way over. I hope God beats you silly on the way over. Because God's not going to put up with that. God did not put you on this earth. You are not, listen to me now, everybody on the internet, you're not the corrector of everybody on Facebook. I want to hear the internet people say, shout it! You're not. You can't, by the way. I didn't found out. You can't. Because they're going to bristle up, get mad at you, and it's going to be this big, long, drawn-out thing on, on my post. I've seen it. Okay? Don't, that's, I'm, I love you. I'm not on Facebook anymore for that reason. I can't, I can't keep myself out of it. I think I have to dive in it and it's not my place. Okay? I love you. But if you will not take the chastisement of God, you are not going to heaven. That's the end of it. That's it right there. So how does God keep us in line? He does it with His rod. Do we have to worry that maybe somebody's getting away with something that they shouldn't get away with? No. Quit worrying about it. Worry about you. Take, pull this out of your eye. Amen. Remove that splinter. Remove that beam or whatever it is. You work out your salvation. You work out your relationship with God. You make sure that you are in the faith. That you are the one being chastised. When I'm preaching the message... You think of what, how this applies to you and not somebody sitting next to you. Amen. God will help us that way. God will bless. God will I want. You heard me pray a while ago. God, I want you to continue to use this church. There's people out there that are, that are re, what am I trying to say? They're responding. They're good. There's a, a 12, 13 year old boy out there in England that is making videos on the internet like me. Yeah! Keep doing it! Amen! And I would hate for him in his lifetime to watch the devil come in here and use our pride against one another and destroy this place. And he watches that and goes, well, I don't want to be part of that. I don't know well, that'd kill me. Verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall not we much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Somebody say amen. For they, verily for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure. In other words, a father chastens his children for what he sees in them, and he's doing it to correct them to live in his house. That's what that means. It's not, it doesn't mean like, oh, I can't wait to whip you. <laughs> Man, I've been thinking about whipping you all day long. Coming home, I'm going, I'm going to whip him. 
Okay? That's not what that means. Okay? But, verse 11 now. Uh, no, verse 10. For they barely for a few days chasing us after their own pleasure. But He, for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. Had you not ever prayed, God, make me holy. God says, okay, bend over. This is how I make you holy. This is how I work in your life. You're a child and I love you and I'm going to treat you like you're my child. Which means that I'm going to love you, I'm going to be gentle with you, and I'm going to be kind with you, and I'm going to feed you and clothe you, and I'm going to do everything in the world for you. You don't have to worry about a thing. But when you start getting unruly against me, I'm not going to have it. And you're going to cross my line, and you're going to push, and I'm going to push right back. And if you'll take that, I'll bless you. And if you won't, you're out. Get out of my house. No father would allow a child of theirs to consistently and repeatedly rebel against them without taking chastisement. No father would do that. God won't either. Can I get God's people to say amen? Now verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Amen? It's hard to take. It's hard to go through. It's hard to deal with. Okay? Um, if you'll read Hebrews 12 and then read 1 Peter all the way through, you'll understand from the Bible that there's two reasons why we go through grievous things in life. The first reason is we had it coming. We sin. God, now watch this now. This does not mean that Christ's atonement for our sins... It's not sufficient and God has to beat us in order to atone for the sins. That does not mean that. When we sin, the atonement and the, the price for that sin has already been paid by Christ. God will forgive the sin. Amen? But if God deems it necessary, God will chasten you so that the next time you're holding back a little bit, you're a little bit stronger now against that than you used to be. Because God knows your psychology. God knows. Even in the animal world. I've been watching animals on YouTube. Lions and cheetahs and monkeys. and uh, Even monkeys and lions. When they have their pride. The lion's pride is a group of lions. And there's always one male lion that's in charge of everybody. Do you know how he enforces his authority? He bites and he claws and he growls. And you get bit enough as a young cub growing up, you learn quickly who's the boss. And that when there's a big old buffalo sitting there with meat hanging off of it, he eats first. And that's the rules. And you want to go against that, he'll bite you and claw you and make you think twice next time before you do it. It's even in the animal world that happens. Who do we think we are? Amen? So he says, it's not joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Notice the word fruit. Turn to Galatians. Mike, here it is. Galatians 5.22. The fruit of a true born-again Christian is not speaking in tongues, women wearing long dresses, men having short hair, people having not, no TV at home, kids don't read comic books, they don't listen to rock and roll music. That is not the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? When God sees issues like that that He wants to correct, He'll correct them. But the fruit of the Spirit, number one, is love. How you'll love your wife better. Or how you'll love your husband better. Or how you'll love God better. Or you'll love one another better. When you get an attitude against somebody in the church and God chastens you over that, all of a sudden now you just love them better. 
I yelled at, years ago, I yelled at the neighbor's kid for coming over here and playing on her playground. I yelled at him, yelled at him, yelled at him. She come over one day and screamed at me, slammed my office door and told me I had no right to tell her kid what to do. And I yelled back and she huffed off and went home. And God dealt with me one day. Reg Kelly preached a message called Take Ye Away the Stone. And how we lay stones of offense in front of lost people. And God dealt with me about that one day. And I went over to their house and I knocked on the door and he answered the door. And I said, is your mom home? Said, well, she's taking a nap. Would you wake her up? This is important. She come to the door about half asleep, but the other half in attitude when she saw me. And I said, ma'am, I just wanted to tell you that your son, he, has, he can come over and play on our playground anytime he wants to, day or night. And she went. And I said, I apologize for yelling at him and yelling at you. I should have never done that. And you know what she said? She said, you know, we've been thinking about going to church. We'll be there Sunday. And they came. One Sunday, they came. That was it. But I removed the stone away from her. Okay? And God, I started loving this woman who is our neighbor. Who are we supposed to love? And I think it should start with her and all these people around here. I don't think we ought to be ignorant to our neighbors around here. Amen? Anyway, love, joy. Because when God chastens you and He's producing fruit now, you're just glad you're not going to hell anymore and you're happy. Amen? Then you got peace with God and peace with everybody else. And when you realize how much God put up with you, you start learning to long suffer with everybody else's nonsense. Amen? And you start long suffering with the preacher because he's preaching past 8 o'clock. Amen. You learn gentleness. And I as a pastor, I want to exhibit the fruit of gentleness to my people and not use a rod every time I preach. That ain't right for me to preach and every time just get a rod out and start beating on everybody every Sunday, every Wednesday night. And I know preachers who do that. And I can tell you they're not very successful at staying at a church. Okay? Goodness and faith. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Meekness, temperance. You know what that means? You can endure things. That, those are the fruits of the Spirit. All that other stuff may be the fruit of a man or what a man told you to do, but these are the fruits of God's Spirit. When you let God chasten you and correct you, all of a sudden, God is bringing forth. It's just like He's the husbandman and every vine of His, He'll purge them. And purging is always not a good thing to go through. But God's doing it for a reason. He's bringing fruit out in your life. Now, I said this. I'm going to say this. I'm going to shut up and be done. Thank you for your long suffering. Two reasons why you'll go through things. Number one, you're getting it because you had it coming. Number two, you didn't have it coming. And you're being persecuted. And when Peter and John were beat by the Sanhedrin... They walked out of there and counted it joy that they suffered for the cause of Jesus Christ. Happy are ye if you go through these things. Either way, when we come out of this, we're happy. And we're at peace. So whether you go through it and you deserve it, or you go through it and you don't deserve it, either way, God is using that for a purpose in your life. Let Him do it. Okay? Stand to your feet or I'll keep you all night. As Americans, Americans now, listen to me Americans, we're, it's born and bred into us that we demand our rights. Right? We're Americans. The fr one of the fruits of the Spirit is meekness. You know what that means? Yielding your rights. If a cop pulls me over, Jared... I don't have to let him go through my car. I don't have to. If he says, you got anything in your car I need to work? No. Can I go through it? I don't have to let him go through my car. I have rights. Don't I? But I'll just yield him and say, you know what? Go ahead. I got, I got nothing to worry. I've got nothing to worry about. You go ahead and go through my car. Okay? 
I'm not saying you have to. I'm just telling you that's what meekness is. Meekness is you stepping out of the way when you have every right to be in the way. Okay, God will give you the knowledge to know how to apply that, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer.